I'll be presenting today on fuel cells and ultra capacitor. So let's get started. Uh, this is the table of contents. So some of the things that I'll be covering, a little bit of introduction, the current trends, where the current industry is going with it, uh, what the current status of the technology is, the software providers, hardware providers, a uh, little bit of technical details of the entire components and the vehicle, some of the rules leading, starting from entry level to top management level, uh, an example on case study, and then how you can enter this domain. Uh, so the fuel cell passenger car market has been picking up in recent times, but uh, there have been OEMs that have been researching on this for a long time. Uh, Toyota has been doing some 20 years of R&D and then they finally came up with Toyota Mirai, which is an actual production vehicle that is available and for lease or sale in countries like US and some parts of Europe as well. Mercedes has also been doing a lot of research on uh, fuel cell powertrain and they have also come up with production vehicles from their A class, B class. Um, Honda has a fuel cell vehicle called Clarity, which is also available in mostly US, but um, maybe it's in Europe, but very small quantities. Hyundai has fuel cell powertrain and they have a couple of models actually, um, and they are also available and they are in production. Audi is due to release a vehicle called H-Tron, which is based on its very successful model called e-tron. e-tron is a fully electric vehicle, but they have taken that platform and they've um, added a fuel cell powertrain to it. Uh, BMW has has also been doing some research research on it, and they've uh, they are going to come up with a third generation of fuel cell vehicle. It's called X7. They've been working with Toyota. Uh, Jaguar Land Rover has been in partnership with BMW, and BMW, as you can see, has been in partnership with Toyota. So there are a lot of there's a lot of collaboration between many companies uh, to harness the knowledge that some of them already have because they have started early, and some are starting now, like BMW, Jaguar Land Rover. They're starting now, so there there is a lot of collaboration going on between the automotive OEMs for this. Uh, apart from passenger vehicle segment, fuel cell has been gaining a lot of attention, especially in transportation se sector. So Hyundai has um, partnered with H2 Energy. H2 Energy is a hydrogen fuel supplier in Europe where they just produce hydrogen as fuel and supply it to vehicles or trucks and any other fuel cell um, component. Uh, and this uh, Hyundai has um, signed a contract uh, where they are going to supply some 1,000 fuel cell trucks to Switzerland. Scania, which is a Swedish truck manufacturer, they have come up with some fuel cell trucks and they have, have done some successful trials in Norway. General Motors in US has developed a truck for US Army and closer to home, Tata Motors has developed a Starbus with fuel cell power trains. Starbus is essentially uh, those buses that are used in the cities for transporting people. Um, so the motivation behind using fuel cell for transportation, as you can see in this picture over here, that as the transport distance becomes higher, BEVs become extremely expensive because you have to have a very big battery pack. And um, also, if you look at the payload, the payload in fuel cell vehicles is much higher compared to uh, electric uh, trucks. Refueling rate is uh, also for SCV is much higher. So you can essentially fill up the vehicle with just hydrogen like you would fill up diesel or petrol in any any other vehicle but for electric as a electric part in as everybody knows it's a very long charging time and uh, so when it comes to transportation that's really not helpful and also range so because the fuel cell is essentially a power producing unit on board it produces electricity and then as long as you have hydrogen in the tank you can keep producing electricity and keep propelling the vehicle so that the range has a very, very big benefit in fuel cell uh, powertrain compared to an electric powertrain. Um, so current trends for ultra capacitors. Ultra capacitors has been in use in automotive for some time now. There's a start-stop systems where when the engine is idling and you stop stopped at a traffic light, the engine stops. Uh, so companies like Peugeot, which is a French um, OEM, and companies like Mazda, which is a Japanese OEM, they have been using this in their vehicles already. So stop-start systems and regenerative braking system. Regenerative braking system is whenever you take your foot off the accelerator pedal, the car just uh, starts decelerating. So all that energy that's there, that's um, uh, is used to charge the ultracapacitor and the electricity from the ultracapacitor is then supplied to the remaining 
onboard appliances like music system, the HMI screen or the lamps and anything like that. So that electricity is essentially coming from for free because of the kinetic energy that's uh, utilized as uh, electric energy in the ultra capacitor. So Mazda IE loop is something that's already been in production using this regenerative braking system. Toyota Yaris hybrid, Toyota Yaris is uh, a hybrid model and they developed one particular model hybrid R where they used ultra capacitor instead of batteries, which is the norm in hybrid vehicles. Tesla recently acquired Maxwell Technology, which is one of the biggest manufacturers of ultra capacitors. So Tesla being a very known brand for electric vehicles, they definitely see a future in ultra capacitors. So they bought Maxwell Technologies. Uh, future scope where this can go in the future. The batteries and ultra capacitor, they complement each other by covering up each other's limitations. So the batteries are very energy dense. So when it comes to range, you need energy, but ultra capacitors are very power dense. Power dense is when you need to accelerate and you are starting from a stopped condition. So in that scenario, you need ultra capacitor, which work better than the batteries. So, um, the automotive world right now is looking into combining the best of both worlds where you can have good energy density as well as power density. So, so somehow increasing the capacity of the ultra capacitors or making the batteries better by using some of the ultra capacitor technology so that you can have a good power density as well as energy density in the, in the energy storage systems on board. Uh, some of the leading hardware solution providers for fuel cell stack. Uh, Ballard Systems, which is the very first supplier that you can see over here. Ballard System is one of the biggest supplier for fuel cell systems. It has been working with most of the OEMs like Volkswagen, Audi, Ford, Honda, and I think there are a few others. Starter also initially had some sort of collaboration with Ballard Systems. Uh, and they have been developing this and they've been in the market for quite some time and so most of the oems instead of reinventing the wheel they sort they at least when it comes to um components and hardware they try to um, procure it from these kind of manufacturers like ballard systems and there are some other uh, suppliers like nuvera fuel cells but there are many oems who have also started like 20 years back. So General Motors and Honda, for example, they do a lot of in-house research in developing fuel cell stack and components and just the entire control system for it. ASIN, which is a Japanese uh, automotive supplier, they also have been working on fuel cell for some time. And there are other companies that like Magna Powertrain and AVL Powertrain that are powertrain supplier companies. They, uh, what these companies do is they, do some collaboration with Ballard Systems and they procure the hardware, uh, which is the fuel cell stack for Ballard System. And then they try to offer it as a solution to customers like OEMs where they have the, the fuel cell system along with the controlling software and safety um, hardware, safety software as well. Toyota's fuel cell system is one of the most advanced fuel cell systems developed by them Toyota as well in-house. And that, that's also the one that's in Toyota Mirai, which is the production vehicle. Uh, New Cells, this is a German company and now they have been purchased by Daimler and Daimler also owns Mercedes. So the Mercedes vehicles, which uh, the class A and class B that have fuel cell powertrain, that came from initially from New Cells systems and they were then later developed a bit more by Mercedes for their own application and then deployed in vehicles. Um, these are some of the um, hardware solution providers that entered a little late in the market, but they are trying to catch up. So these, uh, this over here, Erlinka, this is a German company that's trying to develop fuel cells. Michelin is a tire manufacturer essentially, but they also see a future in this and they're trying to enter this market. And this Plastic Omnium is a French company that's also trying to enter the market. Bosch, as you know, is a very well-known company in automotive sector. So Bosch has partnered with a company called Power Cells that's based in Sweden. And together with Power Cell Sweden, they are offering this Power Cell S3 fuel cell stack um, to the customers. 
leading solution software solution providers so once you procure the hardware which is the fuel cell you need to control it and you need there is a control software that monitors a lot of individual parameters that are happening there to be that are to be controlled in the vehicle so the picture that you see this is a fuel cell control unit it's very similar to the engine control unit it looks quite similar as well so what it really does it, it it monitors a lot of parameters on the vehicle those parameters are the hydrogen supply the air system the thermal and water management system and the the tank system what these systems really are the, the fuel cell essentially runs on hydrogen so you need to control the hydrogen supply like you would control a petrol or diesel supply and in the engines in the conventional engines and there is an air intake as well just like conventional engines where hydrogen and oxygen then combine and then thermal and because it generates a lot of heat you need to manage that heat and all the other uh, water that's generated as well so avl powertrains is also another solution provider that that has fuel cell system solutions and they also are heavily involved in creating test beds and test systems where um, oems and other manufacturers they can test their the fuel cell stack and overall system um, a lot of OEMs that like Mercedes and Toyota, they develop in-house software for controlling the fuel cell system. So all the parameters that you see on the first bullet point here, the hydrogen supply, air system, all the thermal and energy management bits and pieces. A lot of um, development for most of the bigger OEM system in-house and because they also have a lot of intellectual property involved around this, how they manage this more efficiently and um, just to make it work better in the vehicles. Uh, so some of the leading hardware providers for ultra capacitors, they are Maxwell Technologies, like I mentioned. This is now a part of Tesla. Skeleton Technologies, this is IOX uh, Smart Power. There are not too many. There are a few more that are just coming up, but these are the um, known brands for ultra capacitor manufacturers. Um, so now let's get into the details of a little bit what a fuel cell is and what it actually does. Uh, a P PEM fuel cell, so PEM st stands for proton exchange membrane, and that's made up of two electrodes. This is the anode and the cathode, like you have a positive and negative terminals in a um, regular battery. So you have the hydrogen supply, and then you have the oxygen supply from this side. The hydrogen gives up a proton and an electron, and then that this electron is essentially the flow of electrons is what electricity is about. So this this is how it generates electricity. And then this is, this is the reaction that happens. And as you can see over here, the outcome of that reaction is um, H2O, which is water. So what fuel cell basically does is it takes in hydrogen that's stored in a tank, just like a petrol tank in any vehicle. It takes in the um, air from the surroundings and then it does a chemical reaction where it produces electricity. And then the outcome of that is uh, water that comes out of like the tailpipe of uh, the exhaust of the fuel cell. And that's why this, this entire powertrain is a zero emission vehicle. The, all that you get out of this is electricity and water and nothing else. Um, so this is this that you see membrane electrode assembly. This is just one cell. So there are a fuel cell stack is essentially multiple cells arranged together because one cell produces only a small amount of electricity and voltage. And then when you stack them up, like you take a battery in an electric vehicle, there are multiple cells that are arranged in different ways, like series and parallel, and that's what makes a battery pack. So in a fuel cell, that is something similar. What happens, you take individual cells and then you make a stack out of it to produce enough electricity. And that's what a fuel cell stack is. So that's what is in the vehicle. So it's a big stack of multiple fuel cells combined. So fuel cell starvation. So operating a fuel cell is um, not that simple. So there are multi there are problems that one of the biggest problems that is fuel cell starvation. What it really is is that the um, the hydrogen supply, if it's not controlled, then it can damage the fuel cell. One of the biggest limitation of fuel cell is that its dynamic response is very very slow. So what it means that is you are 
you want to accelerate really fast so you are going at say 20 kilometers per hour and you want to get to 80 kilometers per hour so you go 100 percent on the accelerator but the response of the fuel cell to produce electricity to then push the vehicle forward is not very quick so if you draw too much current from it then it dam the the membrane that i showed in the previous slide that gets a bit damaged and so you have to manage the fuel cell such that that never happens because it's more or less a permanent damage. So when that happens, the rate of reaction is very quick, but the supply of hydrogen and the supply of oxygen is not that easily available. And to prevent this, that's where all the fuel cell systems come into place where they try to prevent this phenomenon happening. Um, so like I was saying, in order to prevent this starvation and damage, there are certain systems put in place. Those systems, what they really are, there are many peripheral sensors that ma uh, measure all the, the current flow, the oxygen flow, the hydrogen flow, the, the temperature and all sorts of um, parameters. They, uh, and then they, <clears throat> someone asking a question, what's the, okay. Yeah, so, uh, and then they monitor this and the software, what essentially does is it controls all of these um, parameters and it makes sure that none of the parameters exceed the dangerous point. And so that's where solution providers like Bosch and AVL, they come in. Uh, so there are softwares that are written in languages like MATLAB and ASCAD, which is a Bosch proprietary software or any other proprietary software that the fuel cell manufacturers and fuel cell solution providers use. And all this, what the software really does is it controls all of these parameters to make sure the fuel cell is never damaged and it's never operated beyond its safe operating point. So uh, I'll touch upon what type of fuel cells there are. So there are multiple types of fuel cells. There's not just one single type of fuel cell that's the one that's used in the vehicles. They are, the one that's used in the vehicle is the one showed over here. The first one, which is polymer electrolyte membrane or photon exchange membrane. So it's used in applications like you can see transportation and vehicles. Uh, there are other types of fuel cells as well, like SOFC, which is solid oxide fuel cell and alkaline fuel cell. And they all have their own um, applications like distributed energy. And this one is used in space. So spacecrafts have been using fuel cells for some time now. But one of the advantages of this PEM fuel cell is that it has a very quick startup and load following. So in a vehicle, that's what you need if the passenger gets in the car and it starts the vehicle, you need a response. It just it can start quickly and it can start producing power so you can drive the vehicle. Um, but there are some challenges to it as well, which is an expensive catalyst. So. Uh, all, all of with all of these advantages, this is one of the biggest challenge that's actually preventing it from becoming a bit more cost effective to become more mainstream. The catalyst used in uh, PEM fuel cell is platinum. And as you would know that platinum is a very expensive material. So if you use more of it and the more you want to use it, it becomes the fuel cell stack itself becomes more expensive. So there is a lot of uh, research and development going on and that the focus of that is to find alternatives to using platinum or alternatives to using pure platinum. So if you can combine it with some other metal, so you reduce the use of platinum. That should make the fuel cells cheaper. And if it becomes cheaper, it becomes more affordable and you can do mass production of it. 